Thank you, Councilor. Yeah. If you have your Bibles um, this morning, uh, you can take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Before we get into to the message today, I uh, wanted to share something with you, and, and I think it's it's a really good thing to share it, especially when, uh, when all the folks are here on Sunday, uh, just to kind of give you an idea. This has nothing to do with the message, okay? So just hang on to the message. Ephesians, chapter 6, uh, we're going to begin reading in verse 12. Um, but I want to share something with you. It's an article that I read. It's actually by a, a minister. I do not know him personally, but he spent the majority of his life outside of the ministry. Uh, God called him into the ministry just a few years ago, and uh, he shared some things that um, that he wanted to, if he were to go back, if he were to have to do things over again, and the first part of his life, you know, as he uh, served God and was not a minister, he said there are some things, if I had to do things over again, before I came into the ministry, I would have done some things differently, uh, being a lay person in the church. Uh, but I want to share those things with you in just a moment. But, uh, uh, let's see. Making sure I've got my, my passage right here. Okay. All right. I want to share this with you. And this, this is actually an article that I read again. And uh, basically it says, 10 things I would do differently if I were not a pastor today. He goes on to talk about how that he didn't really understand as a lay person exactly what it meant for someone in the ministry. And, uh, and so I just wanted to share this with you. And it really was a sharing to encourage pastors, but I think it's something that, that church folks need to hear as well. It says, there were ten things I would do differently if I were not a pastor today. Number one, I would make church attendance a priority. I build my week around the services of the church, knowing how vital every person is to the body. I understand what an encouragement it is to the pastor when people give the same priority to church that they give to other places in their life. Number two, I love my pastor. I really mean love my pastor knowing how many expectations are placed on him. I'd be among the group that always was ready to help, but recognizing that he is only one imperfect person, not one to get my feelings hurt if the pastor didn't do everything I hoped he would. Number three, I'd be a generous giver, understanding that there are really a small number who financially support the work of the church. I'd be a kingdom investor. Number four, I'd be an ambassador for the church. I'd use my influence in the community and where I work to bring people to the church and to Christ. I'd look for people I didn't know on Sunday mornings and try to help them uh, acclimate to the church. If I had a problem with a pastor, I'd talk to the pastor, not his wife. That's always a bad move, he said. Not other church members, and certainly not the community. I'd try to get less upset about things that impact only me. There are most... They are, most, they are mostly matters of personal preference. I would pray boldly uh, prayers for the church daily. I would support the pastor and his family. I understand he couldn't be everywhere and never make him feel guilty and never make him feel guilty for not being where I hoped he would be. I would smile when he preaches. Don't you folks know about this smiling thing, okay? I would smile when he preaches. I give visual witness that I was paying attention I might even say amen when appropriate. Oh yeah, definite amens. And then the last thing, I would serve where needed. In fact, I would volunteer without being asked. And this is by Ron Edmondson. Uh, just some things I just wanted you to, to hear this morning. And, and by the way, it's not, when I, when I read this to you, it's not saying that you folks don't do that. It's just giving you a, a perspective maybe that you didn't have before. Uh, about someone who was not in ministry all of his life, but if he had to go back and redo it, uh, that that's what he would be reminded of as someone who is now a pastor. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against wickedness in high places. 
Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins turned about with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherein you are able to stand against the quench of fiery guards of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful today for your love and your grace and your mercy. Lord, we're grateful today that we know that we are a child of God because of what Christ did for us on Calvary's cross. God, I pray today that you would help us to be reminded of some things, particularly about this thing about being in a spiritual battle. Lord, I know I preached this message a while back, not this particular one, but one something like this. But God, I really believe today that you are trying to remind us through your word that God, we are facing a spiritual warfare. Lord, as we look around this world and as we see uh, the warfares that are going on in the Middle East and we see our brothers and sisters who are dying for their faith, God, I pray that you would help us to recognize that this is not a physical war that is being fought. It is a spiritual war. And God, we are in a spiritual warfare today. And though we may not see tanks and guns and those kind of things, God, we are facing a spiritual warfare against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and wickedness in high places. And God, I pray that you would help us to be reminded and to recognize, God, that we are in a battle every day. And it's not a physical battle, it's a spiritual battle. Lord, we're in a battle for our church and for our families and for us personally. Every day we face battles spiritually in our lives. God, I pray that today that we would draw closer to you, recognizing that there is only victory in Jesus. Lord, it's only because of what Christ has done that we can have victory. And God, we know the Bible instructs us that, Lord, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God, I pray right now, Lord, for those who may be struggling in their spiritual faith, in their spiritual warfare, God, I pray that you would encourage them today. I pray, God, that you would, as the reading of your word has taken place, and God, as you speak to their hearts, I pray that today would be a day of victory for them. God, that they would uh, begin to win spiritually these battles that they face every day. Lord, there are some who are discouraged. There are some who are living in defeat. God, I pray today that that, when they leave this place, that they would be changed today because they've heard the word and because you've spoken to them and because they've obeyed what you've said. And Lord, we pray all these things in the lovely name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. We are in a battle today. And we're not fighting against things that we can see. We are fighting against flesh and blood and principalities and rulers of the darkness of this world and in wickedness in high places. We have an enemy today. And you know what? The enemy is not sitting next to you. We have an enemy, and it is Satan. We have an enemy, it is the world. We have an enemy, it is the flesh. And we are a constant battle against those things. But you know what? I fear that we do not realize that today. I fear that we walk through life and think everything's lovely and everything's roses, and it's not. And we put on a show, we come to church and we dress up and we pretend like everything's okay, and then we go back home and we face these spiritual battles, and we know that it's not okay. Folks, Jesus wants us to have the victory today. He doesn't want us to live in defeat. He wants us to live in victory. And so today we're going to be looking at these particular things. If you are a Christian, you are a follower of Christ, you have these enemies. You have these things that you battle with every day. And yet Christ overcame the world so that we can overcome the world. And so I want to look at a few things this morning. Number one, we face an enemy of the world. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, the Bible says this, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he said this, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now I know that you're probably thinking, how in the world does the Bible say we're supposed to love not the world, and yet we're supposed to love the world? How are we going to do that? It's not talking about people, folks. It's talking about philosophy and ideas. We are not to take the philosophy this world has that is anti-Christ and make it a part of our lives. 
We are to love people. We are to reach out to people. We know Christ commands us to do that. But we are not to love the principles and the ideals that this world has. He, he describes what those things are when he said, number one, the lust of the flesh. That is the sin that pertains mainly to our senses, the things that we feel, that we see, that we smell, that we touch. We are not to lust after those things. He mentions the lust of the eyes. That is uh, entertainment and activities, things that we see with our eyes that are not that of God. We are not to live for the same things today as this world lives because it has consequences. He also mentions the pride of life. That is a person who is focused on themselves and the desires, the attention of others. A person who feels that they're self-sufficient and they don't need anybody else, not even God. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know what, folks? That's what got David in trouble, wasn't it? It was lust. When he looked on that sheep, and the Bible said he lusted after her. And folks, I'm telling you, it is not wrong to be tempted, but it is wrong to yield the temptation. And David should have known, this is wrong. I should not have done this and turned and walked away. But he didn't. He lusted after her, and he committed sin. He committed adultery with her. You know, we live in a world today where we want to take sin lightly. Oh, it's okay. God understands. No, God doesn't understand. He died for you. He died so that sin could be put to death. And yet we continue day after day after day to do that which is not pleasing to Him. And it's not okay. It's not okay. The Bible says, should we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. He doesn't want us to sin. But you know what, folks? I'm glad the Bible says, if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous. He doesn't want us to be involved in sin. And folks, I'm telling you, this world is a temptation for us. We're not to love this world. We're to love Christ. And that's really what it boils down to. Do you love the Lord or do you love the world? Which one? You can't serve two masters. You've got to serve God or you've got to serve the world. You cannot serve two. You're either serving one or the other. You know, Christians, brothers and sisters today, it does not happen... Being worldly doesn't happen overnight. It's something that is a gradual thing. The Bible talks about, uh, first, there is friendship with the world. Then we are spotted by the world. And then what begins to happen is that Christians start to, to love, not the Lord, but to love this world. And John, John warned us not to love the world. God and this world are such opposites that you cannot love both at the same time. And there is such a battle going on in our minds today because there are so many things that are appealing to us that we look at and we think, man, this is good. And yet God is telling us, do not love the world. Don't be a part of these things. The lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Don't let them be a part of your life. Love the Lord supremely. We are in a battle, folks. We're in a battle spiritually. We don't need to love the world. But also, we're in a battle against the flesh. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the Bible says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You see, we live in a, in a world that is motivated by fleshly desires. Our human nature is bent toward sin and darkness and desires that are not pleasing to God. John chapter 3, verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. But the sad thing is, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. As Paul writes to the Galatian church, he charged them to, be, to stay away from the sins of the flesh. And he goes, to, he goes on to say this in three different things. He talks about physical sin, that is, things that involve physically, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness. He talks about the spiritual realm. He talks about idolatry and witchcraft and hatred and variance and immolations and wrath and strife, seditions and heresies. And then he talks about sin among us, that is, among humans. And that is envies, murders, drunkenness, and revelings. These are sins that people face today. They are facing the battle with the flesh. And in order to have victory, we need to learn 
what our enemy is. We need to understand our enemy. We need to understand that this is a spiritual battle. Folks, we are in a spiritual battle, whether we realize it or not. Every day, we face this spiritual battle. The enemy is real. And he is that which attacks us. The Bible says that Moses, his hands became weary. And he got to the point where he had come where he, they had to come and hold up his hands for the fight was long and drunk all day and he became weary in his battle. You know what? Sometimes we become weary. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes I just want to say, man, Lord, I want you to just quit come back. I'm so tired of fighting these spiritual battles. I just want you to come on back and so we can be in heaven together. We don't have to worry about sin anymore. But the truth is we face it every day and we've got to be encouraged and we've got to be on guard because we are facing spiritual battles. And these attacks are something that happens all the time. You know, we ought to thank the Lord when we have times of victory. But we always ought to be on alert because we need to be prepared to fight a spiritual battle. I also want to tell you, how did the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ fight spiritual battles? He did it with the Word. And how many of us, day after day after day, we never pick the Word of God up, we never read the Word of God, and we wonder why we're defeated. We wonder why we keep, keep giving in to sin and temptation. We wonder why we're not in the Word of God. And David said, Thy word have I hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against God. You've got to use the Word of God. It is one of the things Ephesians 6 tells us that we are to use in this spiritual battle. But we have an enemy, and he attacks us. And he does it many times when we least expect it. One of the things that you find out in the Christian life to be true is that after some of the most great, wonderful times spiritually that you'll ever have is when Satan comes in and will try to defeat you and try to get you off of that spiritual high, the enemy attacks. Think about Elijah. Elijah, at this point that I'm talking about, had just went on the mountain and he had a battle between him and between Baal, the prophets of Baal. Do you remember what happened when Elijah had this great victory and he told them, look, you go ahead and you put your altar together and you put the, 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 the animal on the altar and you... You know, you pray to your God and see what happens. And then, all of a sudden, Elijah gets up after they had prayed all day long. He kept themselves and cried aloud and all these things, these crazy things. He got up and prayed a simple prayer. Basically, as Lord, let them know that you are the only one true God. And he set fire down from heaven. This is a great victory for Elijah. But then you find him a little bit later, and he's cowering down, and he's, he's wanting to die. Wanting to die because he was defeated. He was defeated. Jesus, after his baptism, when he was anointed with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God descended like a dove, um, descended upon him, and the Bible says that Jesus was led out of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. This was a special time when the Spirit of God descended, saying, this is my Son, and whom I am well pleased, and this is a great time, and immediately after that, here is the temptation of Satan. So we find many times in your life when you are spiritually revived and you're closer to God than you've ever been before, that is when Satan will attack. And we need to be on guard against that. He attacks us in this way that is unexpected, but he also attacks very viciously. The devil attacks when we are weak. The devil attacks the weakest part of our lives. Folks, he doesn't get his head on he knows where our weaknesses are. He knows where your weaknesses are. And that's where he attacks. The church is not above the attacks of Satan. The church can be attacked even in the midst of some great times. And folks, your pastor can be attacked even in the midst of some great times. You know what? I'm, just, I'm sharing my heart with you today. Some of the hardest times in my life and some of the times that I've, that I've faced battles more than any other times, it's when things are going great. When things are going good, and you say, what are you talking about? Well, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. The church, as the church will grow, and the church will do well, and people are saved, and people are baptized, and people are joining the church, things are great. And you know what Satan will do? He'll come in there and say, guess what? You can't keep this up. 
The church can't keep this up. Things are not going to do, continue to do well. And he begins to discourage. And you know what? That happened to me not too long ago. And you know what God reminded me of? This is my church. Not mine. Yes. He will build his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Folks, we're serving God, not ourselves. We're serving that great and wonderful God. And when He, when Satan attacks us, we look to Him, who is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the one that has already won the victory. And we can have victory, even in these battles that we face, because Christ has already won the ultimate victory. We can have victory over the flesh. We can have victory over the world, because Jesus had that victory and has that victory. You know what? Even though the enemy is strong, if we ever hope to win the victory, it is only through Christ. It is only through Him that we can win the victory. But we face the battle every day against Satan. And you know what? The Bible says to be sober in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. The enemy is described many ways in Scripture. He's described as an adversary, as a roaring lion, as someone who is out to seek and destroy anything, any evidence, or any witness that you have for the Lord. John chapter 8, verse 44. The Bible says, He was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And yet, we see and we are, we succumb to the lies that Satan would tell us. And yet, God tells us in his word, He is a liar. Don't listen to him. He is your adversary. He wants to destroy you. Don't listen to him, because there's no truth in him. And then in John chapter 10, and verse 10, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. But I am come up, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Are you glad that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus? We are. Why don't we start living like we are conquerors? Why are we still defeated today when we serve a Savior that loves us, that is risen? Death couldn't hold him. He, was de- he defeated death, hell, and the grave. He defeated sin. We have the victory all because of Him. But our enemy, the devil, in Revelation chapter 12, and I'm not going to read all of this, I'm just going to kind of tell you what it says. In verses 7 through 11, He is called the great accuser because He accuses God's people day and night before the throne of God. He is an adversary or an enemy of God. Back in chapter 4, Verse 3, he is called the tempter. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, he is called the serpent. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, he is called the God of this age. Why is it that believers today cannot be reminded, they cannot understand that Satan is the God of this world? That we are not to love this world. That we are to stay away from the world, the flesh, and the devil. That we are to do what we can to be uh, victorious through the Lord Jesus Christ. All the verses that we talked about just a second ago, they depict the devil as being wicked. That is, he is our um, the one that we face a spiritual battle with. And quite often in our lives, he will do whatever he can to gain the advantage in our lives. Folks, I'm going to tell you, he uses anything and everything he can to defeat us and deter us from doing what God wants us to do. You know, when I think about the fact that God wants this place to grow, and it has, but we're not satisfied. God's not satisfied. Listen, until he comes back, we're going to be working for him. We're going to be building his kingdom. We're going to be reaching out to people who need to know the Lord. And that's why I try to challenge you all the time. And folks, you know what? If people get upset at me for telling, telling people that they need to witness, then they're just going to have to be upset. Because that's what God commands us to do. And you know what? If I didn't love you, I shared this with Sunday school class this morning. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't tell you the truth. I would say those things that I thought you wanted to hear. But folks, because I love you, and I want you to do what's right, I'm going to preach the truth to you. And I'm going to do it without apology. And I want to tell you, 
you today that we are in a battle and that many of you are losing the battle. Many of you are defeated today. And I'm telling you, I know, I can see it on some people's faces. When I look around the room today, I see some people who are defeated. I see some people who are discouraged. And it, it's got it's a lot of different things, I'm sure. But God doesn't want you to live there. He wants you to live in victory. He doesn't want you to give in to sin and temptation. He wants you to live for Him. Satan will do whatever he can to get the advantage in our lives. To choose to be loving and considerate even when our spouses or our children respond in a different manner. Folks, I want to tell you, that's a real battle. It is a battle between husband and wife and parents and children. To react in a way that would glorify yourself is a temptation. To react in a way that said, how could you ever do that to me? Or how could you ever say that to me? And begin to be mad, angry, and upset with each other. That is a spiritual battle that we face our families. It is a spiritual battle to be honest today. To be upright. To be a person of integrity. Even in the workplace. That is a battle that we face. And it is a spiritual battle. To stand up for God and to serve Him. That is a spiritual battle that we face day by day. I wonder how many of us in the workplace cower down from our, for our faith because somebody else confronts us about it and somebody else tells us, you can't do this or you can't do that. And we cower down in our faith and we're intimidated. But folks, there, is no such, well, there should be no such thing as intimidation to a Christian because we serve the one true living God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is a spiritual battle to teach our children the truths of God's Word. And folks, we're failing. As a general rule, Christians today are failing in teaching their children the principles of the Word of God. And how do I know this? Because children are becoming more and more and more adamant against that of authority. When you look around us, you see children, even more so than I've ever seen before, that are rebellious to authority. And why is it? It's because mom and dad have not stood up and taught the Word of God in the home like it needs to be taught. I'm telling you this because I love you. I'm not telling you this because it makes me feel good. It doesn't. This is God's message to you today. And you know what? There are, there are young people and there are teenagers today that rebel because of some of the rules that mom and dad set down. And they're saying, you're not fair. And you know what? Uh, I'm not going to listen to you. And they began to rebel in that. By the way, can I tell you this? With as much love in my heart as I can, the Bible says that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Folks, I want to tell you, that's, that's a serious thing. It's not something God takes lightly. Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. I'm not telling you this because I'm a parent. I'm telling you this because God says this. And He is concerned about that. To live a Christian life every day and to choose right over wrong. That is a battle that we face. Every day, we face choices as to whether we're going to obey God and do that which is right, or disobey God and do that which is wrong. We face these choices every day. No matter where you're at, I guarantee you every day you face them. And yet, how often do we say, man, I just don't think I can do right today. I don't think in this situation, God will understand in this situation. No, God will not understand. Right is right and wrong is wrong. And there is a standard for that that we have it right here. It's the Word of God. And whatever we base our life on, if it's not based on the Word of God, there's nothing we can stand on. If you say you believe in the Word of God, and you believe in the God of the Word, then you need to do what's right. You need to live for God in a way that's pleasing to Him. Stay away from that which is wrong, that which is displeasing to Him. There's a battle today to do what is right and honorable and godly over that which you've been desired to do. You know what? Every time we face a spiritual battle, there's a decision. Man, do I do right or do wrong? Do I listen to the Spirit of God or do I listen to the desires of the flesh and the desires of what Satan would want and the desires of this world? What do I do? Folks, we need to give in to the Spirit. We need to listen to the Spirit of God as He speaks to us and as He leads us. And you know what? The Bible says that we're not to quench the Spirit. And that's quenching Him when we don't do what He says. We're quenching what God is trying to do in our lives. 
There is a battle today to instead of staying home, coming to church like you ought to. You know, the Bible says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some end. As a matter of some is. Folks, I want to tell you, we need worship. We need corporate worship. We need corporate fellowship. I don't know what I would do without God's people. I know God is my helper. God is my strength. But I want to tell you what. He uses so many of you to encourage me. And you know, I hope that that's what I am to you. We are to encourage one another, lift one another up. And we do that as we fellowship together, as we worship God together. It's a battle when you choose to spend time with God over your friends, over your things that you like to do, your hobbies. And I've got them too. I've got hobbies that I like to do. And I believe God placed things in our lives for us to enjoy. But folks, any time that we place those things above our Lord and Savior, it is a sin. It becomes an idol to us. And it is a sin. And that is a battle that we face every day. Well, should I do this? Or should I come to church on Sunday morning? Should I do this? Or should I skip church on Sunday night? You see where I'm going with this. It's a battle today to admit that you're wrong in the face of consequences rather than lying your way out of it. Yep, that's a temptation sometimes. Well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you get this done? And maybe at work, your boss comes to you. Why didn't you do this? And rather than tell the truth and own it up to it, you say, well, I've had this come up in my life. My grandmother passed away. I mean, the dog ate my homework. I mean, you know, whatever excuse you want to give. Why don't we just simply learn to tell the truth and to, to not give the end of what Satan would have for us to lie, but simply to tell the truth? You know what, folks? We face difficult seasons in our lives. We face difficult battles in our lives spiritually. And the enemy is not a friend to us. Satan is out to destroy us. He is out to kill us and to destroy. Verse 12 of what we read in the passage. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, and high, uh, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And folks, he is out to try to destroy what witness, what example that we can give. There are Christians today that their, their testimony is destroyed. They're defeated today. They're occupied too much with the things of this world. And they're keeping their eyes off of Jesus rather than on Jesus. And I, folks, I know these battles are real. I know that you face them every day and I face them every day. And you're facing some battles in your own, your spiritual life personally, but in your family's lives. You guys have issues I know that you face every day between moms and dads and young people, between husbands and wives. The question is, are you going to do things God's way? Follow the instructions that we have from His Word? And as the Spirit of God leads us, are we going to give in to the world, the flesh, and the devil? and watch our personal lives spiritually go down the drain, watch our families go down the drain, watch our churches go down the drain, or are we going to, to get in this battle and fight in this battle? Fight against this spiritual wickedness. Fight against this enemy, the, the devil. Are we going to do that, or are we just going to give up and give in? And there are some of you today that are discouraged because you face temptation after temptation, and you have yielded to that temptation time and time again. This is a wake-up call for us today. And God is saying, it's time for you to be in business with God. It's time for you to get involved in this battle and quit being defeated and live victorious with Jesus Christ as your leader and as your guide. Why don't you let him do that today? You know, as I look around, I know, folks, there are some of you are discouraged. It may be about your family. It may be about a son or a daughter or a relative. It may be somebody you've been praying for that have not yet made a decision for the Lord. And you're defeated. It may be a situation at work, and you're defeated. He doesn't want you to live there. Folks, we need to be victorious. He has overcome this world. And we can overcome. We can have a victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And folks, we've got to understand that we face an enemy. And he is trying to defeat us. And we need to learn what his tactics are. And we need to learn to get in the Word of God every day. And we need to learn what it means to be the kind of person that God wants us to be. I was reading a book the other day. I'm going to share this illustration and then I'm going to close. 
as Brother Aaron gets ready and Miss Diane. I was reading a book, and have been reading a book. I read several books at a time. I, I try to get a little bit at a time because I can't go for a whole book at one time. Some of them sit down and read a whole book. I can't. This is a, it's a book. It was written many years ago. It's by a, um, a Christian author named Leroy Himes. And it's, it says, be the leader you were meant to be. And this is an encouragement, not, not just for pastors, but for moms and dads, and even for young people, to be the kind of leader God wants you to be wherever you go. And I want to share these principles with you. And it basically says this. Uh, this particular uh, part of the, of the book talks about being pure, uh, purity of life. And then it talks about principles, how to know right from wrong. And these are... Um, these are uh, four principles that I want to share with you. If you're wondering whether something's right or wrong, there's some questions to ask yourself. Number one, is it helpful? Is this going to help me spiritually? Is this going to help me draw closer to God? And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, is the verse that you use for that. Is it going to help me live for God? Number two, does it get me in its power? If I do this, if I make this decision... Is it going to get me in its power? Does it enslave me? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. Anything that gets, gets you in its grip, uh, habits, so forth, you need to leave alone. Um, and then number three, will it cause someone else to stumble? Folks, that's a, that's a good principle to live by. You may say, well, I don't think it's wrong to do but what about this person over here? Is it going to cause this younger, this weaker brother or sister to stumble? Is it going to cost, cost them to think that way about me and about the Lord? And then the last thing, and this is certainly not the least important, I think the most important, is what I'm about to do going to bring honor and glory to my Lord and Savior. You say, well, it doesn't say right or wrong in the Bible. It doesn't matter. Does it bring honor and glory to God? What does the Bible say? Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. It's what I'm about to do. It's going to bring honor and glory to God. Those are some things to think about uh, this morning as we get ready for an invitation. For Eric will come. Miss Diane comes. Let's all stand and close our eyes, bow our heads. No more sitting around.